Hey, Annie, guess what? What? We just launched a business of biotech newsletter. Yeah? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. What am I thinking? We don't need another <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, I might have been thinking that. Annie, I swear on my grandpa's grave, you're going to like this newsletter. That's a pretty bold swear, Matt. Uh, hear me out. It's monthly. Only once a month. It's ad-free. And it's modeled after the Business of Biotech podcast. It's got the same insight from the builders of biotech that you see in the podcast. So what's not to like? That actually sounds like it doesn't suck. Pretty high praise, Annie. Check it out. Bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Go there and sign up for this newsletter. You won't regret it. Just before this past Christmas, the CDC reported a seven-month decrease in average life expectancy. That came on the heels of a 1.8-year decrease the year prior. That plunge, no surprise, has been driven in large part by COVID-19 deaths. What many researchers are surprised about, however, is the fact that COVID deaths in 2021, which totaled 417,000, surpassed the roughly 351,000 lives lost to the disease in 2020 before the vaccination effort was underway. These are among the statistics making the case for better COVID vaccines, vaccines that are more durable, easier to administer, and better at reducing or eliminating transmission among the vaccinated. I'm Matt Piller, and on today's episode of The Business of Biotech, We'll be spending some time with a guy on the front line of the push for better COVID vaccines. Dr. Shankar Musunuri has spent the past nine years leading Ocugen, a multimodal, multi-indication drug developer with clinical stage biologic and cell and gene therapies for ocular, osteo, and rare diseases. But more recently, it's made strides with Covaxin, its late-stage COVID vaccine, as well as an earlier clinical stage COVID-19 mucosal vaccine candidate. We're going to learn all about that shortly, but first let's get to know our guest, Dr. Musunuri. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, and as I said, I want to get to know you a little bit. And uh, to do that, we're going to rewind quite a ways back. I, I want to, you know, I, I found it interesting when I was looking into your background that you uh, you earned your undergrad in pharmacy and, and earned your PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from UConn. Um, and, and when I when I see the you know the the PharmD or the pharmacy sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, it, it always kind of makes me wonder what the intention was back then uh, when you were pursuing that undergrad and then that that graduate degree. Was it your intention back then to, to get right into therapeutic development or was the sort of the, the more traditional pharmaceutical, or I'm sorry, pharmacy realm where you were headed? Yeah, the undergrad, uh, I think um, when I was working, um, you know, I had an opportunity to work in research when I was doing my undergrad. And uh, probably that's a rare opportunity students get. I got interested in research. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did uh, actually as an undergrad student, I used to, whenever I have time in between, you know, the work I need to do, uh, I actually joined a very famous faculty member and it took me and it really trained me. And that actually opened up, you know, got me interested in research. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I had a, a, we used to have a good co-op system where I did my undergrad. And the last six months, you know, I had an opportunity to either go to the industry or go to, you know, research labs and do research. And I chose actually research. And uh, I worked in one of the central research labs. And uh, again, that elevated my interest in research and in drug development research. And then that led me naturally into, you know, program at University of Connecticut. That's a direct PhD program after undergrad. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tough program. Mm -hmm. It's good. Um, um, I started that. And uh, when we started in, in those days, um, I started working for uh, uh, a faculty member and, and a, a good foundation background. And the biotechs, you know, at the time in the 80s, you know, you got Genentech and Amgen's coming up and, you know, Roche. Um, you know, some of these uh, large companies also started getting into biotech. And uh, we had an opportunity to, um, you know, in the graduate school at that time, applying all the foundational, um, you know, principles in pharmaceutical sciences, you know, like, like a, um, a physical chemistry and biophysics and all these tools and uh, how to study large molecules. And, and this is a fascinating research, right? 
because they're not small molecules. These are like biologicals and they're very unstable and, and really understanding about them. You know, these macromolecules, you know, how do you, how do you characterize them? How do you stabilize them? And, and, you know, and how do you, how do you make that um, um, product out of it? And so that, you know, you can put it in a syringe or a while, it stays there for two years at two to eight. And sometimes, you know, some of the biologicals are frozen products because they have, um, and they're not very stable. So really understanding and studying those macromolecules. And I had an opportunity in graduate school to really um, in the pharmaceutical sciences, you know, at the, the cutting edge of biotech, some companies are coming out in 80s. And we had an opportunity, our lab had an opportunity to get training in that, you know, collaborating with biophysics and really understanding, applying all the biophysical tools and studying these macromolecules. And so that got really interested. And then uh, as a graduate student, I did have an opportunity and, you know, I had a um, opportunity to um, become a, get a fellowship from uh, you know, J&J and Mark and a couple of companies. And obviously with the Johnson Johnson, um, they provided an opportunity for me to come and work there. Mm -hmm. And I took a little break from my PhD and almost like a co-op, very mm -hmm. rare. And uh, my professor was very supportive. Hey, you'll get some industry experience. I'm fine. Take a little break. And uh, I mean, however, that's the only exposure I had for small molecules. And I was not doing biotech research there. It's working on small molecules and, and uh, um, uh, trying to develop a, a product with, uh, you know, multiple components in there, um, you know, for oral delivery. I, that's a good exposure for me. You know, I got yeah. the industry experience and uh, then I decided to take that experience and go to the industry, not to go into academia. Yeah. And, and I thought I can, I can directly contribute to drug development research. And obviously since uh, our group is working on um, biotech um, geared projects in, in the graduate school, I got exposure to that. Even though I had an opportunity to work in, you know, a small molecule side in the large pharma, I chose to start my career in a biotech in San Diego, because I had an opportunity, I wanted to take the risk, you know, because I, I was fascinated with uh, biotech and science. Yeah. You know, that's had what you, led me into that. Yeah, I was just curious, had, had you not done that co-op program, uh, you know, that, that exposed you to industry, albeit in a small molecule capacity, had, had you not done that, uh, do you think perhaps you, you would have stayed on the, the academic path and continue to do academic research? Or, I mean, what, what did, did I you think, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, I, I think that, uh, that industry experiments did have a lot of influence on me. Number one, yeah. um, you know, um, I mean, it was a great exposure I had as a graduate student, uh, very supportive group of individuals um, at j, j really were very encouraging, very motivating. Mm -hmm. And they treated me very nicely, taught me a lot of things. And uh, I think that changed my, I, I agree with that. Yes. Yeah, that, that actually exposed me to the industry. Then I said, ah, you know, there is an opportunity to work there too and contribute directly, you know, into drug development, which goes into the patients. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you're right. It, I think uh, since undergrad days, I was doing research. Naturally, my progression would be become a faculty member. And mm -hmm. uh, that undergraduate, co the graduate school co-op working at a large pharma opened my eyes. Yeah. And I, I said, ha, there may be opportunities here where I can directly contribute. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still, uh, you know, in those early days with a, with a focus on research, at what point in your, in your career, as you progressed, did it, uh, I guess, become clear to you or even become a possibility perhaps that you might uh, take, take on more responsibility as a leader, as opposed to, um, you know, a, a, a clinician or a, a researcher? Like what, when, when did, when did that store so, sort of uh, unfold a little bit for Dr. Musanori? It's a, it's a, um, when I was in uh, graduate school, um, I was a first student uh, who got PhD because I had a, you know, PhD advisor, professor. I was actually first student. Everything is like first, right? You had, and uh, you're doing a lot of work in the lab and other mm -hmm. students follow you. And, 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 and also I had an opportunity to, um, you know, um, a, a drive an organization called International Students Joint Association when I was in UConn. And we were working on some things and now uh, help other international students. 
and uh, and I, I think uh, I ran that organization. It gave me some exposure uh, as a student leader. And uh, so when I joined uh, the biotech in San Diego, Amelin Pharmaceuticals, and one of the things in biotech, you know, biotech pace doesn't change, just like oxygen. You know, you're moving at 200 miles an hour, mm -hmm. and 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 if you survive, you can learn a lot. I yeah. mean, it gives you great exposure. I mean, same thing happened uh, when I was at Amlin. I was a young scientist working in the lab, and uh, they went from, uh, I think, less than uh, 100 employees. Um, probably, probably, they had probably 50 or 60 when I joined, and they suddenly went to a 300 plus in like a three plus years. I was there, yeah. And a program moved from early stage clinical to phase three, and then other programs are getting lined up. And we had a collaboration in those days at J&J. &J. So it was a monumental jump as a company where they moved on. You know, they started getting uh, a lot of people and uh, the program is progressing really well. And uh, when you're on the front lines, when you're running the lab and I became a, young scientist became a group leader running a, you know, a big lab and mm -hmm. uh, hiring a lot of scientists myself and training them, right? And that's the exposure really excites you because, I mean, it's not easy, right? You know, what you learn in thesis and graduate school research project, now you're really going there in the real world, you're applying it. Yeah. And, and you're building a team, you know, you have these human interactions with other functional areas in the company. And it's a fast moving organization. And uh, I mean, if you're willing to run at 200 miles an hour, it's a great opportunity. Yeah. And, and I learned a lot. And thanks to, you know, um, biotech uh, opportunity I had, again, a lot of good people there, a lot of bright minds, people from um, a lot of good schools. And, you know, they're all working together for a common cause. Mm -hmm. And they're all passionate about patients. You know, we're in endocrinology, diabetes area in those days. Um, um, very passionate about diabetic population and, you know, how we can help them out with the, with the product we're making. And I think uh, that gave me, a real good entry into industry and also gave me good exposure and experience as a leader. Yeah. Uh, as a young scientist, you know, not only just doing research, I was also building a group myself and uh, got exposure to leadership. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we're going to, we're going to revisit another stop on that career trajectory here in a minute, but uh, I'm, I'm curious then the next step uh, sort of, I'm, I'm, I want to dig into the inflection point that led to the next step or influenced the next step you took, which was to go out and co-found your own uh, emerging emerging biotech company. So what was that? Like, you, you know, what was it just an extension or a continuation of that leadership experience that you got uh, at, at Amlin uh, that, that started then and kind of worked its way up through, through Pfizer? Or, what, or was there some other circumstance that led to the decision to go out and co-found your own company? I think uh, the multiple things, I think uh, the Amelin one definitely gave me an exposure. Then I came to um, a join another biotech is on the cutting edge, you know, they're mm -hmm. working on uh, gene-based vaccines in those days with Vistar Institute, a small company called Apollon. And uh, um, so I came and joined at a, you know, um, a leadership and, and a great exposure. Um, and then at a very good science-based company and when I got in, uh, obviously, very shortly after I joined, um, the company got uh, taken over by Wyeth. Yeah. Because they're doing a lot of collaboration projects with Wyeth. Then I got exposure to big pharma. I never thought I'd work for a large company, right? I really like biotech, you know, working like running at 200 miles an hour on the cutting edge science. And uh, I got exposed to Wyeth. I mean, I think uh, I really have to thank um, a lot of my colleagues at Wyeth and the leaders. Um, it's a great company. Um, I mean, I got uh, immediately, they gave me an opportunity to work in R&D in one of their vaccine sites in Marietta, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And then within like a few months, they said, why don't you also run this lab in our New York site, Pearl River, um, you know, why it uh, actually then it became a Pfizer site eventually. Um, um, and so, and, and the New York site. So I used to actually commute between the two sites. I got uh, very good exposure to R&D and, I, and, and I, we were in vaccines division. We had uh, um, great exposure to all kinds of vaccines, you know, yeah. viral vaccines, bacterial vaccines, like, you know, Pervonar 20, the Pfizer launched, and we were working on those days. You know, it was Pervonar 7, it became 13. 
mm-hmm. and a uh, lot of exposure the good thing about wired uh, they really gave me an opportunity matt to move from r&d into operations into in a corporate management yeah. uh, um i think uh, i mean they're they're great leadership very good people you know when you have when you're ambitious and i want to, what are the next steps are i was doing a unique project actually i mean we're talking about mucosal vaccine i was working on rsv mucosal vaccine you know um you know trying to get some intranasal rsv mm-hmm. um, um development working at the formulation and the device very unique device you know and uh, working with a french company we designed it um very very novel um un- unique and uh, some of the management really like that you know the path you know we're taking very innovative and they and then um one of the senior leaders in operations really liked it when they had an opportunity you know they allowed me to work in upside right i moved into corporate offices and uh they gave me exposure at that time um i got an encouragement and support to do my mba uh, global executive mba at duke mm-hmm. and uh and uh, just to learn on the business side right so that actually exposed me and helped me and after that you know they allowed me to move into running this global operation strategy teams and uh, giving exposure to on the business unit working with the business leaders and uh, i think all these things it's almost like a transition i mean i do have to thank the companies i worked for and the leadership i worked for yeah. uh, without them i know, you know i wouldn't have got an opportunity to i mean you really have to learn and uh, you need to have your own goal where you want to go and when i was doing my mba i started writing business plans right hey you know maybe you know i can start a biotech company maybe certain things i can do better than big pharma and one of the things i think which really hit me was when i was working in vaccines at that time at wyeth um you know there is a lot of need for these pediatric vaccines in who countries mm-hmm. you know you can take countries like developing countries like africa and other places a lot of kids die because of lack of vaccines yeah you know that work you know uh, gates foundation bill gates is doing is amazing you know as pharma companies we can all do a lot more than bill gates but you know i mean he started the uh, the process and uh, he really contributed a lot i have a lot of respect for bill gates mm-hmm. not because he founded microsoft but what he did with gates foundation you know saving so many lives and that's the passion i had oh as pharma companies we can do a lot more you know gates in outsider to pharma industry did so much you know yeah. all of us can do a lot more i was always uh, looking for an opportunity you know maybe there are a lot of things i learned in big pharma there are other things probably as a biotech we can do better on the innovation side and moving things faster to the patients and uh, i always was looking for it and one day i had an opportunity after you know and and we merged with pfizer pfizer become a you know why it got bought over but pfizer management again are extremely nice um i mean because they really saw the value why it was a very good biotech company they are like a number one vaccine in the world like prevnar at the time globally and they had embrel one of another large biotech products you know we built a very large biotech um you know uh, plant in ireland which became like a really very cutting edge innovation large biotech plant and so pfizer respected it and uh, i mean we were treated very nicely in pfizer organization and they gave me good opportunity again to lead you know pernar 13 global operations team and uh, um i learned a lot and and again i had an opportunity to run a biotech and i took off in 2010 and yeah. uh, and then pfizer uh, management team were very supportive they helped me out in fact my first biotech when i started um you know there are two vaccines one of them was sitting on the shelf i went and got it uh, and and a uh, so small vaccine there is another vaccine which is making um you know less than 100 million dollars in revenues it's a small product for pfizer and uh, they helped me out and supported getting into the old company i had and and so pfizer did support me when i started my first company that was and, no uh, no really support you so i right. think all these things add up as an entrepreneur you know you cannot do it yourself of yeah. course you know you need to have an ambition you need to have a you know i would always say greater purpose my greater purpose was you know building that passion for patients uh, really contribute to that you know uh, yep. for human health and that was driving me right maybe i can do certain things better you know but i can use all this expertise and network you know working biotech and big pharma help me out and that gave me confidence and that gave me the experience and to jump in and take risk of course 
nothing comes out easy, Matt. You know, as an entrepreneur, number one thing, I think, uh, I mean, I had to tell other entrepreneurs who are growing up there, want to start companies. Number one thing you need to have a good support from family, mm-hmm. which I had. Yeah. Uh, my wife is a physician, very passionate for our patients. She works extremely hard. And uh, I mean, without her help, there's no way I would have become an entrepreneur. I mean, she gave me a lot of support. I know it's taking a risk. You know, I mean, I could have stayed in a large pharma, I had a nice life, right? Right. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and it's not easy to run a company, raise funds and taking care of your employees. I right. mean, so you always have to think about it. It's not, then the employees become your family. You have to take care of them, you know? And that's a great support I had right from the get-go for my wife and my boys who are grown up now. And uh, they gave me more than 100% support. You know, we went through a lot of ups and downs. And today I'm here because of them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, so all the learnings I had in the large pharma and biotech, a lot of support I got from my network, uh, my colleagues and ex-leaders. And, uh, and then couple that with great support I had from family. I mean, they're there for me, my ups and downs. Yeah, and, that's and, uh, excellent. I can always go home and, you know, I can always get more support and motivation from them. Say, nope, they're going to do it. You know, this is it. This is just a fall. Um, you know, you can step up. You know, everybody's going to fall. Yeah. And they're running biotechs as entrepreneurs. It's a very, very tough out there sometimes. It's not easy to raise funds. And uh, you will get a lot of bumps on the road. And you need to stand up. You need to stand up and move on. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the work that uh, that your family is so happy to support, some of the work going on at Ocugen. Um, and full disclosure, I feel as though we could probably do several episodes on Ocugen just because of this wide, as I said, uh, the, this wide, uh, the breadth of of uh, of candidates and, and modalities. Um, but I, but I want to try to transition. We're going to run short on time here if we don't transition to this vaccine yeah, <laughs> vaccine yeah. conversation. So I want to try to transition to that. When you founded Ocugen, this was your uh, second, I believe, biotech, the first being Neuron Biotech. Uh, or, yeah, Neuron Biotech back in 2010. Founded Ocugen in 2013. Um, you know, at that point in time, uh, it was it was well before I started covering the space. But when I started covering the space a few years ago, vaccines weren't necessarily a sexy place to be, right? They weren't, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of money being dumped into them. They were, you know, recognized as, as having super long development times. They were risky for new biotechs, that is, to, to endeavor in. Um, that all changed, obviously, with COVID. Uh, so, so take me back to 2013 when you founded Ocugen. Um, again, before vaccines kind of took this, sec, you know, got got their second coming, if you will, uh, that, that COVID prompted. What was your mission back then in founding Ocugen? Was it in, in any any manner of the the spaces I mentioned here, rare disease? Was it you know we want to be a cell and gene company tackling, you know, osteo issues or or ocular disease? What was the intent when you started it? Because you know, you've, you've defined uh, nimbleness, I would say, in, in the time since then. Yeah, the Akujan, uh, the co-founder, uh, you know, um, and myself, um, you know, Professor Compella is a professor at University of Colorado. Um, when I was taking a break from the first company, um, I mean, he's doing a lot of work. He's very well known in ophthalmology and uh, he did a lot of research. In fact, one of the biologicals, Akujan 200, we're going to file the IND uh, mm-hmm. targeting diabetic macular edema and wet AMD and first quarter next year that came from his lab. So he said, you know, um, ophthalmology has a significant unmet medical need mm-hmm. and we can do a lot of good. You know, can you spend, you know, a couple of days with me, um, look at my research and see where we are. And uh, I went and um, um, I did spend two days and uh, reviewing. I said, uh, you know what? I got exposed to many disease areas in my life, endocrinology to autoimmune diseases to uh, infectious diseases and vaccines, but this is uh, something new to me, yeah. and uh, I'm willing to learn. And uh, you are an expert, and uh, let me let me see. And, and when I looked at him, when I did my own research, and he's right, there is so much of unmet medical need. When there is so much of unmet medical need, we can do a lot of good. Yeah. You know, I mean that's where you know we can really help patients out. Um, and uh, I mean there is a risk; you have to take the risk, right? That's why it's unmet medical need. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's how the oxygen got started, really working on, and then. Uh, unmet medical needs in ophthalmology space, because if you take the back of the eye retina space, there's so much is unmet, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, people only talk about with AMD, diabetic macular edema and DR, um, because we have ILEA, we got other products in the marketplace, 
uh, do make you know a lot of money um, um, you know globally. And uh, however, they don't understand even those current products. You know, uh, not everybody um, really reacts to them, right? I mean, they they're not of significant amount of population across the globe are non-responders, even for you know, existing products for beta AMD. So there is unmet medical need. And uh, that's where that biologic gets in. And then uh, with our network, um, you know, we had a opportunity to collaborate with uh, Dr. Haider at uh, Harvard Medical School, Chief and Science Institute. And she's a genetics person. She spent about 20 years, you know, and she worked on human genome and she's very passionate. And she's, she spent her lifetime inventing this modifier genes. You know, we had an opportunity to, you know, collaborate with Harvard, license the technology. And then we, we, we really started moving into it because it's a very unique, uh, this is nothing like other gene therapy approaches you have. It's not like gene editing or traditional gene therapies. Traditional gene therapies typically are, are gene editing. You got a mutation of a gene, you try to give augment a non-functioning gene, you give a functioning gene through, you know, a AAV vector to deliver that, then you control the disease progression. Gene editing, you try to you know replace that, right, mm -hmm. um, and and fix that. However, we believe there is a underlying pathology network which causes that mutation. It's not just that mutated gene. Okay, that's where the modifier genes come in play. I mean, I mean these genes uh, in the in the retina they control the entire functional network and all associated gene expressions, and, and they reset homeostasis at cellular level. Mm -hmm. So they have ability to, um, you know, um, like if something is not functioning, they use the entire network to overcome that, you know? Um, and that's a concept, right? So we have a lot of good data. We published a, um, a paper in Nature uh, many years ago and, and showing the same gene can go after many genetic mutations. It's almost like a gene agnostic approach, Yeah. first time. You know, using this modifier concept, we took it to the clinic. And last week, we got a broad retinitis pigmentosa and a liver congenital amaurosis, uh, like, a, like a broad uh, orphan indication from FDA, um, orphan drug designation. We already got it from EMA2, European Medicines Agency. So what does it mean? That means between RP and LCA, we got 125, you know, genes which can get mutated. And that means... The mutations can be in multiple points. There is no way drug companies are going to develop, right? More than 125 products, taking yeah. care of these 2 million patients across the globe. At right. least 120,000 in US struggle with this, similar number in Europe are a little bit more. And so most of the companies work on, on a gene therapy. Okay, let's take this in our 2000 patient population. Let's work on it, that rare disease. What happens to other patients, right? So these genes have ability to, we have potential to treat all this population. So one G in the first one in the phase two, phase one to clinical trial, we already gave a you know, um, press release. The safety looks great. And uh, we're hoping to get some efficacy data from phase one to trial next year in 23. And then we'll move on to phase three in US and Europe. So this is what started us. You know, that one modifier gene therapy gene, which is already in the clinic, has ability to reach all these rare diseases. And now yeah. we're getting validation from EMA and FDA with a broad orphan disease, typically you get like a one mutation at a time. We're going to, you know, potentially solve all these problems. And then another one, which is coming behind it, RQ410, based on the RORA gene, in second quarter this year, uh, next year, we're going to file IND, targeting dry age-related macular degeneration. We're going to initially target the late stage population. There are about 10 million patients struggle with dry AMD, significant unmet medical need globally nothing available today to treat these patients. So 1 million are at the late stage, it's called geographic atrophy, they're desperate. 1 million patients. Mm -hmm. so imagine, you know, we have, we have very exciting data from in vivo animal studies and in vitro cell culture models. And we have a product, RQ410, which we believe it has potential to treat these patients. It's a very complex disease. It's not like a one target is going to fix it, that's why we believe this another gene, which is a modifier gene, would control these functional networks. There are like inflammatory issues, you know, lipid metabolism, oxidative stress. There are multiple factors which cause the disease. And we believe, you know, this potential one-time curative approach, giving a one injection back of the eye, 
Yeah. It's, it's going to answer these patients, it's a large population. So we got one gene targeting all rare diseases, another one targeting large population. The same gene, we're also targeting a disease called Stargast. It's, it's a large uh, orphan disease, like 35,000 patients in US alone. And uh, we're going to use the similar you know, product, same gene, which, which may have a different composition, but you know, it's going to target another. So there are two um, INDs will be filed in second quarter next year with our gene therapies. And uh, it's going to target you know, large disease burden. So that's how we got involved. We built a, um, in a good R&D and in a clinical organizations, technical organization, right? When you have these uh, groups, how did you transition into vaccines? That's your question. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need to know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash emerging biotech. So now I'm going to get to <laughs> yeah. So when Yeah, you, well, when I mean, you, it's, you know, I, I think of it like I'm, I'm listening to your story and I'm going, what, you know, the, the intrigue, the excitement, the opportunity to learn leads you to this company. Uh, you, you've obviously gone all in. Uh, and then along comes an opportunity to jump back into the vaccine game. You know, like, so, so tell us that Genesis story and whether it was like a, an opportunity that excited you to kind of get back into your old vaccine stomping ground. Yeah. I mean, when 2020 hit, right. COVID hit. Um, I mean, we already have a, a very strong R and D uh, and, you know, technical organization here. And uh, typically, um, I mean, the biotech, you know, the cream of the cream works in biotech and the people who work in vaccines, they understand gene therapies. Some of the, pro if you take adenoviral vectors, you know, the, our mucosal vaccine, the processes used are similar to how you manufacture gene therapies, mm -hmm. a lot of similarities. And similarly, these bright minds who understand how to grow, you know, um, these biologicals and in, in, in using cells, um, they can also focus on cell therapies, what we have. So it's, it's actually technically, if you take the, I would call it a foundational platform, we already have that. Yeah. Right. So when the vaccines, you know, when the COVID hit, one of the things, I mean, obviously, personally, myself and some of our team members who also came from Pfizer, and we're all looking at it, we have a vast network um, in vaccines, and uh, we have a lot of experts, and we pulled, uh, you know, three bright minds from UPenn, um, and then I pulled my ex-network from Pfizer and say, guys, you know, we're looking at this landscape, it's killing people, a lot of people are dying with COVID. And uh, is there anything we can do? We're looking at this US landscape. Um, you know, they're working on mRNA vaccines, new technology, it's great. Um, you know, it's easy to manufacture and get to the market quicker. However, they're all working on one concept, taking one part of the virus like S protein and all these vaccines are designed over it. Mm -hmm. What if tomorrow, eventually it's going to mutate, we know that. And then the, the vaccines will become less efficacious, less effective. And uh, there is this company in India, you know, they're working on this whole variant based whole virus inactivated, just like you make polio vaccine, which eradicated polio and then the flu vaccine, rabies vaccine, many vaccines are made using this platform. It's safe platform. And they developed this vaccine uh, working with, uh, you know, equivalent of NIH in India and taking one of the adjuvants, which was developed at NIH, uh, through collaboration. And uh, this vaccine is uh, good because it's a whole virus. So if one part of the virus has, you know, mutation, if you take this, you'll have good memory, not just antibodies, mm -hmm. T cells and B cells, you've got a memory response. So that means you have, you will develop adaptive immunity if you take this vaccine. So that means if one part of the virus is mutating, your system will recognize it and, and that's why it's adaptive immunity. It'll try to neutralize it, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a good vaccine. I think it's good to have multiple tools in our toolkit. This is like fighting a war and we are prepared as soldiers. Yeah. So we cannot sit on the sidelines and say somebody else will solve the problem. Right. So that's why we jumped in. We said, hey, we have biotech, we have 
very bright minds at Oxygen, and we have a network of vaccinologists, you know, based on our ex experience. And we pulled the team together, a good, very strong scientific advisory board. And uh, they all supported, you know, thanks to our board. Our board was thinking the same way and very, very supportive. And uh, said, hey, you know, this is a pandemic. People are losing lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is like a war. Can we jump in and contribute, do our part? That's why we jumped in. We had yeah. an opportunity to work with this company, uh, which is a powerhouse um, in Asia. And that they launched over 15 vaccines, delivered over 5 billion doses of various vaccines to developing world, including Africa and other countries, did a lot of good. And so this is a unique vaccine. So that's how we brought Covaxin. We immediately jumped on it. And then um, recently, obviously this year, you got the problem, right? What is the problem? The problem is people are vaccinated four or five times. They're still getting infected, right? Um, so now um, there is a, another variant coming out, Omicron is BA5, you know, now the BA7. And, and so the transmission of the disease is a major issue right now. Why it's a major issue? Um, because if you're elderly or if you're immunocompromised, you're, you're, um, you know, you're at the high risk. Um, you know, you're not getting hospitalized if you're getting vaccinated, but you don't know. There could be another variant coming up. It could be deadly, maybe worse than Delta. So the most important thing we have to do as a, you know, from public health perspective, we really have to work on how to control the transmission. Yeah. That's really important. You know, yeah. I mean, you need to control the transmission from where the virus enters. And that's why we got and licensed the mucosal vaccine, um, you know, from Washington University, because both India and China, large countries already launched mucosal vaccines. And as US, you know, being number one in innovation in biotech, we are behind. Yeah, and, and I think I think uh, that's where the mucosal vaccine come into play mm -hmm. to control yeah. the transmission of the disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An important point. I, um, you know, when you when you look at sort of mainstream coverage of the vaccination uh, status and uh, COVID uh, transmission and and deaths, uh, one of the recent stats to arise is this fact, I guess, that uh, COVID deaths among the vaccinated now outnumber. COVID deaths, deaths uh, among the unvaccinated, which, you know, just looking at it from a numbers point of view, well, of course, right? There are more, far more people are vaccinated than not. So it's just, just a numbers game. But is there more to that story? I mean, it, you know, to me, it kind of speaks to some of the uh, opportunities for improvement in in the in the current uh, vaccine landscape. What, what, yeah, what, I mean, yeah, it's, it's very, um, I mean, you made good points. It's difficult to draw conclusions because when you got, you know, 70, 80% vaccination rate in the U.S., um, I mean, I mean, some of them are vulnerable patients, you know, um, mm -hmm. elderly, and, you know, maybe they have other underlying diseases, you know, so it's a high risk. And so I think obviously some of them, you know, it's a numbers game, just like you said, you know, the majority yeah. of the population is vaccinated. Of course, you're going to see deaths in that population more. So I don't, I don't think we can draw conclusions based on that. But what is definitely important is certain population is still not vaccinated mm -hmm. because we, we com, you know, we completed the dosing in our phase two, three clinical trial, immunobridging and broadening trial with the co-vaccine. And uh, we, we, we still had new patients who are not vaccinated in the clinical trial. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important. I think, I think some of them may have vaccine hesitancy because of the new technology like mRNA. That's why we still want to push co-vaccine, which is a, you know, the foundational platform, you know, it gives a primer. You know, the mucosal vaccines are good, but you need to have primary series with the other vaccines, like, you know, through IM injections. So, and this could become a good vaccine for people who are hesitant, you know, that, yeah. that remaining percentage who didn't take vaccines. Hey, this is an option, which is built on polio vaccine platform. It, it, uh, it, it is known technology and uh, it has a good and you know, a favorable safety profile. And uh, it's already given to you know hundreds of millions outside of US. It's not a new vaccine we are trying to introduce. And here is the US data. So we're going to release some data um, by next month uh, from our phase two, three immunobridging trial. Number one, what this trial, this data will do, it will bridge the immunology, the immunogenic responses to US is equivalent to Indian population, the large trial done by our partners in India. The second one is as a subpopulations, um, we also had patients, right? I mean, subjects, because you can't get all new populations. We enrolled people who took mRNA 
vaccines. So used Covaxin as a booster, we'll get the data too, heterologous booster. So there is a definitely a need for more vaccine options. That's where Covaxin comes in. Mm-hmm. And then the mucosal vaccine is important. People who got vaccinated, and if you give a mucosal vaccine, you know, we're trying to you know, intranasal or inhalation. You know, China launched inhalation vaccine, which is doing well with the lower dose. And India launched a intranasal vaccine, yeah. right? So they both are good, but we believe inhalation may offer a better opportunity. So we're seriously looking into that because you have a large surface area. Maybe you can have a lower dose, which is always good. And also um, maybe it will have a better protection because of large surface area with lungs. And so we're going to look into that pretty seriously. And uh, the goal is if you give a vaccine, mucosal vaccine, and they'll elicit you know, mucosal antibodies in an in a upper respiratory tract where the virus enters in the mouth and nose, so you can control the transmission and neutralize it, number one. Number two, it'll protect you. Number two, you're also going to protect others. There's high risk and elderly when you're, you want to visit somebody, right? And, and you don't transmit the disease to them. That's very important. Right. And that's how you control this pandemic. You really have to control the transmission. So that's why we got into this mucosal vaccine. We believe, uh, you know, there is a reason why two of the most populous countries already launched mucosal vaccines. You know, yeah. they also want to control the transmission. And I think, I think it's high time that U.S. stands behind it. That's where, you know, we need that war speed 2.0. Yeah. And we need, uh, you know, this is a public health emergency. I think uh, um, irrespective of who's running, um, you know, who's in Washington, uh, I hope, you know, they all come together to support this cause and continue to um, support funding for, um, you know, next generation COVID vaccines. Uh, the vaccines we launched did, a, you know, really wonderful things in controlling hospitalization death. And many, many lives were saved. I think we really have to thank our, our, our leaders, you know, who supported public health. And I really, uh, I'm urging them, you know, really begging them to really pay attention to this. It's not over it, you know, and it's not over it. And so please consider, you know, continue to fund it for the next generation vaccines to control the transmission. We need yeah. more tools in our toolkit. We're not done. We're in what the middle your, of a war. Yeah. What, what, is your, uh, what, what is your vision or version of Operation Warp Speed 2.0? look like? I mean, just sort of describe for us what, what, uh, what that looks like. Cause every, you know, everybody thinks about operation warp speed and it was, it was unprecedented. It was, um, you know, it was, it was obviously very expensive. Uh, it saw, saw a lot of things for the first time in terms of public private partnership. Um, I don't know, you know, operation warp speed. I don't know that anybody would be quick to want to jump right back in, right back into that. But what, what do you, what do you see necessary in a 2.0 version of that? I mean, uh, I mean, there's a, I mean, as I mentioned before, right? This is a war. It's not done yet. Mm. And when we're, we're swimming in the middle of it. And I think, and being complacent and stating it's under control is an, is an issue from public health right. perspective. There is no yeah. way we have any control. Yeah. And if, if people look around, all I have to tell is somebody has to look around 360 degrees, their family and friends and see how many people got infected in the last three to six months. That gives us an answer. There is no control of this pandemic. So that's where Operation 2.0 comes in. They did up, I mean, Operation 1.0, thanks to them, a lot of funding went in. I mean, they deployed vaccines like never before in a very short time, yeah. saved, saved a lot of lives, preventing hospitalization death. Now we need to look into vaccines which control the transmission, also yeah. provide more options for you know Americans to control uh, the disease burden and also death. You know, because you may have variants, as I mentioned before, which could be deadlier than Delta. And and you want to hit it ahead of the time. So you don't want to wait, right? So that's really important. The transmission is a major issue. That's where Operation 2.0 need to focus on. Okay, the current vaccines are not controlling transmission. Let's look into newer technologies, newer vaccines like mucosal vaccine. Let's fund them. Number two, there's a study came out in the Nature publication um, not too long ago. Uh, this is a study done in over 400,000, um, you know, VA, um, you know, patients and uh, patients who are getting repeat infections, they are ending up with a long COVID. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they're getting a lot of issues with health. And that means just like you mentioned, you start off your podcast, you said, you know, 
yeah. the life expectancy is going down. I mean, that yeah. article actually talks about it, yeah. you know? So getting repeat infections is not good. I mean, getting an infection, I mean, natural infection is good. It gives a broad immune response, but getting repeat infections and that article goes into getting long COVID complications. Right. And many of these, um, and they're going to go for a long time. And the researchers and scientists are still figuring out how to treat these patients, you know? There are a couple of clinics set up in Columbia and Emory. They're really doing cutting edge research, but we're struggling with this, right? So that's another issue. Transmitting a disease, getting multiple times infected is not good. And so people have to really pay attention to this. The data is out there and uh, nobody has to give them that. I think uh, the government and USG has a lot of good, bright scientific minds advising them and the information is out there. Yeah. And, and I think, so the Operation 2.0 really had to focus on, number one, how to control the transmission. Number two, there are people out there who are not vaccinated. Think about providing options to them, encourage them to take vaccinations, you know, because you don't want to get the disease. If there is an option there to get the vaccine, you know, you don't want to get the transmission or hospitalization or death, please take the vaccine. It's yeah. really important. Everybody takes vaccines. How, how do you, I uh, just, just sort of a, a flyer question here. How do you anticipate or what do you anticipate in terms of the commercial and, and, and marketing effort? Should, you know, Covaxin be, be approved? Should the mucosal uh, vaccine candidate be, be approved? Assuming, you know, that, that, that those products do what they, what they intend to do as far as durability and as far as uh, stopping or reducing transmission better, better than what we're looking at right now. You've got that inherently vaccine hesitant crowd uh, obviously that we saw right we, we we've been we've been seeing for the past 18 to 24 months um but then there's also this there, there there's a at least i would anticipate uh a level of weariness around e even among those who have been who who are on board from the get go yes you know give me my give me my two doses give me my booster give me you know however many boosters that they've had since um and still and still transmission is out of control and still, you know, sure. Uh, the, the, the vaccine has prevented untold uh, hospitalizations and, and sure. deaths, sure. but on the things that on those elements that you're trying to solve, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I'd grade it. It would certainly wouldn't be an A, right? Like in, 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 in terms of durability and, and transmission, which creates a, a, a poor patient experience, multiple boosters, still, still tr transmittable. You know, how do you overcome that? Even if you have a better widget, even if you create a better thing, how do you then overcome? Because remember, uh, there, there are a lot of folks saying early, in early days, misstating government officials at the highest level, you know, misstating the attributes of the Moderna and, and, and Pfizer vaccines, misstating the job that they that, that they could do, right? Saying that they will prevent transmission, saying that they will prevent, uh, or that they will be durable, that it won't be a never ending experience right. having boosters. So, I guess it's it's a very general question. It's going to be difficult for you to answer. But like, how, how do you go into that battle, Doctor Musanuri, and say, you know what? Like, I can overcome that apprehension, that uh, that that hesitancy, that mistrust. I think, yeah, I mean, these are all great uh, questions. Um, I mean, obviously- Hard, hard, hard to tackle. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I think people have to step back. People yeah. have to step back and, you know, I think there are a lot of bright people out there. Um, people have to step back and look how vaccines work. Mm -hmm. They really have to go to fundamentals of science, focus on antibodies. Antibodies will come, they'll wane eventually. What you need is a T cell memory memory response. Nobody focused on that. Yeah. You know, Covaxin, our partners have published papers, you know, at 12 months, they still had a good memory response. So yeah. if you're giving a vaccine based on, oh, antibodies are coming and going, take it every three months, you're absolutely right. And people are getting tired of, you know, I mean, it's almost like a overwhelmed. How many times can I take it? You know, I mean, you're willing to take flu shots every year, provided it's annual shot. Yeah. At least, you know, I think uh, uh, the part of the um, issues are um, not just with industry. Um, um, the government also, public health perspective, they need to come up and ask 
um, um, manufacturers to show uh, memory response and durability data. That's very yeah. important. Yeah, which we simply okay. didn't have. The, and, the, yeah, the first, and, first and, going on, we just didn't have that. That's right. Yeah. We didn't have that. So they need to focus on how the vaccines work and say, not just antibodies. You guys need to also show durability. I think they need to ask that. You know, mm -hmm. Covaxin showed that. In fact, uh, we believe that no viral vector-based vaccines, mucosal vaccines also will have durability. To answer your questions, the only way we can, you know, win the customers and, uh, and, and everybody's help, you know, there'll be some people, you know, who will be vaccine hesitant, right? And we should not be negative on them. Sure, you know, no. Our job as mm -hmm. scientists is to educate them why vaccines are good. If they, they have some other belief, they don't take them, that's okay, respect it, you know? Right. And, and, and don't say anything negative about them. That's not nice. You right. know, I mean, our goal is to educate them and then offer the options, yeah. right? And, and you cannot force people and then offer science based on that. If you educate, they are willing to take it. That's great. But provide them options. Don't give them less one option. Say you take it. Otherwise, you're going to get hospitalized, you right. know? And so definitely you have to show durability and you need to go into something like flu vaccine. And you take something on annual basis, mm -hmm. then I think you will get a lot of support yeah. from consumers. And you say, okay, when I get the flu shot, I'm going to get you know, uh, you know, oxygen's uh, inhalation vaccine, right? And uh, it's easy for us to change the strains like flu vaccine with uh, with the with the technology we have with our you know potential inhalation vaccine on an annual basis, you know, um, like a CDC and and WHO if they come up with how they you know, announce the flu strains every year. You need to work on this. And I think eventually it will get there. They're going to announce and say, why don't you guys work on this for upcoming season, flu season? Mm -hmm. And so you'll have a COVID vaccine and you have flu vaccine. Uh, and so that will be ideal. So you need to go into that more. There is no way you're absolutely right. People are going to take every two, three, two or three months a booster shots and, and they're getting tired. They're getting fatigue, you know, vaccine fatigue, and they're not going to take it. I think, I think you need to scientifically take a step back and say, hey, these are the vaccines. They have either broad immune response. They're durable. They work at least for a year, just like flu shots. You take it annual basis. I think you'll get a lot of support. So now that's part of the war speed 2.0. 1.0, mm -hmm. deploy. Get as many people vaccinated ASAP. Prevent hospitalization death. Great. Done. 2.0, focus on transmission. Focus on durability. Focus on moving this into this annual vaccination. Develop vaccines to support that yep. with a good scientific evidence. Okay, provide more education. You know how the vaccines work. That's really important. Yeah. And be very transparent with the data. You know, make all the manufacturers to publish the data. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and I think the CDC and the government should share all the data, what is available so that Consumers looking at different options can make decisions. Sure. I mean, will the vaccination be controlled by the government in the future? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about what the 2.0, it's ideal. I mean, if you're going to control the transmission, a mucosal vaccine initially, sure. I think uh, um, just like they did initially, they should procure some vaccines, distribute them and educate you know, public. Then slowly um, they should prioritize it, you know? And then people can take them like flu shots every year, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you go there, you take a flu shot and you take like a, you know, our mucosal vaccine, that's fine. So I, I'm not worried about commercialization going into, naturally it'll progress that way. You yeah. know, some of the mRNA players are already anticipating, hey, in a year from now, you know, it's going to be prioritized, they'll be ready for it. Uh, but Warp 3 2.0 not only should support next generation vaccines, they should also procure Part of those next generation vaccines, mucosal vaccines, and and then then you know deploy them, and then then you know educate public, and so there are multiple steps they need to do: educating public uh, on and, and telling them, hey, we have multiple options available. You sit with your physician, you sit with your pediatrician. As a family, you make a decision which vaccine is good for you. Mm -hmm. Matt, I think the important thing is, if you give only one type of vaccine, it's very difficult. Some people think you're forcing them. Yeah. Okay, that's a human tendency. Right. But if you provide scientific evidence and uh, let them sit with their physician or pediatrician, make decisions for the family, you provide the options, let them decide. This is a scientific evidence, right? And yeah. then more people are willing to take the vaccines. And I think the vaccination rate will further improve. And, and I think, uh, and then 
people will be more tuned to taking annual boosters. That's what we want to get to. If we get to annual boosters, just like flu, we have done our job. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of the the science and the data, and we're running short on time here, Doctor Musinuri. So I'm just gonna we're, we're gonna have to wrap things up. But to, to wrap things up, speaking sure. of the data, give it give us an update on what's next for uh, for Covaxin and what's next for Ocugen in terms of uh, you know Covaxin in terms of uh, I guess clinical progress and next steps in the clinic. Yeah, we um, you know as we mentioned before, the phase two three immunobridging and broadening trial. Uh, uh, went well. In fact, uh, we're going to uh, release the top line results by January, and and they're going to show immunobridge to data generated by our partners, large phase three clinical trial in India. In addition, we'll get heterologous booster data. You know, after mRNA, if you take covaxin, what does it mean? Mm-hmm. Are you getting protection from current variants? Um, and and so that's then we'll we'll continue to work. It'll provide a great option for Americans. We're going to work with the USG. Because you know these vaccine research and development cost a lot of money, so that's yeah. why government we believe you know if we're providing options, they should fund it. You know, work with you know it's a private public partnership because of emergency. So we'll continue to push that, provide that option for Americans. Um, you know, we would like to work with USG closely and and get support because that's really important because it's it's a public health emergency. Number two, mucosal vaccine. You know, we're doing a lot of background work right now. On the manufacturing side and the inhalation technology side, and uh, and uh, with the preclinical, so we also submitted a package to FDA, um, you know, outlining our plan for phase one, two, and three. Uh, we'd like to work with them and, you know, get the roadmap agreement with FDA, how to develop it and make it available. And in parallel to that, we are working with the various uh, USG government agencies to secure funding. So we really want to move those two programs forward. Yeah. Um, so to control this pandemic. So that's in a, but what is oxygen? That's your last question. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have exciting, you know, we recently announced our uh, cell therapy program for cartilage repair. It's one of its kind, very exciting uh, platform uh, for, you know, regenerative, um, you know, cell therapy uh, for cartilage lesions. Yeah. Uh, we agreed with FDA, our design is good, ready to go. And uh, we can't wait to initiate the manif- um, you know, clinical trial. The rate limiting, of course, with cell therapies is personalized medicine. It's autologous cell therapy. So we're building our own manufacturing suites in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And uh, whenever they're ready next year, uh, you know, late next year, we'll, we'll initiate our, you know, our uh, late next year to early 2024, we'll get into phase three. And that's going to be amazing. Uh, again, that's just the beginning of our cell therapy program. It's not the end. And then we'll do multiple things in the next few years to come. So yeah. we'll have vaccines for public health, gene and cell therapies targeting unmet medical needs, and uh, our gene therapies. And our goal, uh, the, if you look at our entire platform, our goal is to launch all these products in the next five years. You know, and uh, that's, uh, so- that's aggressive. As as I said uh, from the outset of this conversation, uh, you, you know. We could do five episodes because we, you know, maybe, maybe modality specific, maybe platform specific. I, I'll tell you what, though, we'll we'll do a follow on 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 the on the cell and gene therapy side. You know, we'll forget about this COVID stuff for a while. I'll come down there. I'll drive down to Malvern. It's not too far. I'm up in the other other corner of the state. I'll take it when that manufacturing facility is ready for me. We'll take a ride down there and we'll do uh, we'll do an in person recording uh, focused on on those cell and gene candidates because it's you know, that's uh, that's equally fascinating. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Yeah, we look forward to that. You know, we want to get those products out there. Yeah, and uh, you know, our, our biggest goal, as I said, in a higher purpose, uh, it's it's uh, our work is not done when we launch this. Uh, and uh, game-changing therapies to the market, we'll continue to work extremely hard to find ways to provide market access to patients who need them globally. That's really important for us. Yeah, It's yeah. not just getting to the market. We, we want to provide access to the patients who need them, not just in US and EU, right. across the globe. That's a, that's a higher purpose we have at Oxygen. Good deal. We'll keep up the good work, Dr. Musanuri. I really appreciate your your time today and your uh, willingness to come on the show. I know we didn't get to everything, but uh, we'll 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 do a part two. I promise. Thank you. Yeah, I would love that. And uh, thank you so much for having me. So that's Occugen Chairman, CEO, and Co-founder, Dr. Shankar Musanuri. I'm Matt Pillar, and this is the Business of Biotech. 
We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva, which demonstrates its support to new and emerging biopharma companies at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. If you like listening in on conversations with biopharma leaders like Dr. Musanuri, subscribe to the Business of Biotech podcast. Sign up for our newsletter at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Be sure to leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>